Deutschland. In English, we refer to this nation as Germany, a name given to the region by the Romans, who called the lands east of the Rhine Germania, Germania. The history of Germany is not necessarily the history of a single nation, but of a people administering German nations, a situation which is not only one of the ancient past, but even one which the German people have faced in our modern age. This nation's history is fascinating, impressive, and profound. However, much of it is overshadowed by more recent events. While the events of the First and especially the Second World Wars, with Germany at the center of both, are of major historical importance, we must also discuss the hundreds, in fact thousands of years of German history prior to these events to understand what Germany is in the big picture of things. In this documentary, we're going to do just that. Today, here on Fire of Learning, we're going to explore the history of Germany from its earliest beginnings to the modern age. The land we know as Germany was first inhabited by modern humans around 35,000 years ago. The Germanic peoples, however, arrived in the area nearly 3,000 years ago, as climate change prompted migration from their origins southward from modern Scandinavia and northern Germany. It is around this time that the Germanic languages and cultures began to become distinct from the people farther north. As they moved, they encountered and bordered other peoples such as the Celts, Slavs, Baltic peoples, and Scythians. Much of what we know of these early people and their lives prior to Roman contact comes to us from archaeology, linguistic analysis, and even genetic testing. Written records of the peoples of Northern Europe in ancient times are scarce. The earliest few written accounts are fragments left from the fascinating yet mysterious man known as Pythaeus of Massalia, a Greek explorer, in the 3rd century BC. More detailed descriptions come to us from the Romans, who, ever expanding, inevitably came into more direct contact. Very direct contact. One of the first main interactions between the Germanic tribes and the Romans was the Cimbrian War of 113 to 101 BC. Sparked as tribes from modern Germany, known as the Cimbri, Teutones, and Ambrones, moved further south as their land farther north had become less hospitable. They would be defeated, but this would only mark the beginning of a long, intense relationship between Rome and the German tribes. The first to refer to the Germans as the Germani was Julius Caesar, though this classification was more about geography than an actual analysis of the peoples living in the region, who though shared a number of similarities, were rather diverse linguistically and culturally, and far from unified. They in fact were often at war with each other. Those in Gaul were the Celts. Those across the Rhine River were the Germans. He described them largely as barbarians. They were a people who lacked towns and cities, and who depended on primitive subsistence agriculture, often leading very difficult lives in comparison to the Romans. They followed a form of paganism which was similar to others in Western Europe at the time, specifically to Norse mythology, with an emphasis on nature and the natural forces around them. They worshipped gods such as Mani, Tu, Woden, Thunir, and Frigg. You are likely more familiar with these gods by the days named after them. Monadog, Tu's dog, Woden's dog, Thurner's dog, Frigadog. They later spread to England after the fall of Rome via the Anglo-Saxons. Tacitus later added to the Roman understanding, describing the Germans as a large people with reddish hair and piercing blue eyes, referring to the 50 or so Germanic tribes inhabiting the region at the time. At times, relations between the Romans and the Germans were peaceful and cooperative. Trade, intermarriage, and other interactions took place. At other times, there was brutal warfare. Under Augustus Caesar, the Romans would actually attempt to expand into Germania. The area, however, was a much harder region to enter and subdue than Gaul. The thick forested and marshy landscape were very foreign to the Italian Romans, and heightened their fears of the barbarian savages they thought were living within them. The lack of roads in major towns made the logistics a nightmare for a large Roman army. As they moved eastward, the Romans would begin encroaching on the Germans further. They would build settlements, such as Colonia and Aquae Grani, which would become cities like Cologne and Aachen, or Aix la Chapelle. The Romans attempted to quickly subdue the Germani, placing taxes on them, confiscating their weapons, replacing their old legal systems, and essentially taking some of them, particularly the sons of noblemen, as hostages. 
These boys were raised in Rome as Romans, largely with the hopes that they would return to Germania loyal to and cooperative with Rome. In the end though, this process would come to backfire on the Romans. One of these Romanized Germans was a man named Arminius. Arminius was taken and put into the Roman army, being the son of a Cheruscan chief. During a campaign into his homeland under Quintilius Varus, he would later defect to his native side and use his knowledge of the Roman army to ambush and defeat them. In September of 9 AD, the Roman army was ambushed by Arminius and an army of United German tribes near Calcrisa in what is remembered as the Battle of Teutoburg Forest. Around 20,000 Romans were brutally decimated by the Germanic troops in one of the most significant battles in Roman history, if not the most significant. For the Germans, this was a great victory. Arminius was hailed as a great warrior, and in the eyes of some, is Germany's first hero. For the Romans, this was a horrible disaster. They withdrew their designs of the province of Magna Germania, preventing not only the Romanization of Germany, but even beyond. Arminius would continue to lead, perhaps envisioning himself as a future king of all the Germani, but he was murdered by political rivals before such a thing as a united German nation could come to fruition, and Germania returned to the disunited state it was in prior to these events. The main cause of this? The concept of Germania was a Roman invention, existing in the minds of Romans, but not in the hearts of the many different peoples living in the region, at least not yet. This would not be the end of the story of Romano-German relations, far from it in fact. In the 2nd and 3rd century AD, as Rome started showing signs of decay, the Germanic tribes began coalescing and expanding. These tribes would have a significant impact not only on Germany, and in fact not only on Europe, but the entire Roman Empire. The Goths, Vandals, Franks, Alemanni, Macromanni, Bavari, Angles, Saxons, Lombards, and so forth. The Goths would be the most troublesome to the Romans of these groups, raiding, pillaging, and destabilizing many parts of the empire. In the 4th century, as the Huns began moving westward, pressure was placed on the Germanic peoples, and they too were forced to move westward as the Huns spilled into the borders of modern Germany. The Romans, significantly weakened at this point, lacked the power to stop the massive waves of people crossing their borders and settling in their territories and instead attempted to integrate them. Much of the army, in fact, would later come to be comprised in a majority by Germanic soldiers. The intention was for these foreigners to be Romanized. In many ways, they were. In the 4th century, the ones in Rome were Christianized and were introduced to the advances of Roman society. Around 350 AD, the Bible was translated into the Gothic language. As the Roman Empire fell, many of its successor states were formed by, or were taken over by, rulers from the Germanic tribes. These kingdoms would arise in many places, even as far as North Africa. Some of these kingdoms would disappear. The majority would not become Germanized, but rather the German rulers assimilated into the native population. But some, such as the Anglo-Saxon dominance in modern England, would be more permanent, having a lasting effect on the language and ethnic identity of the people on the island. Though never truly under Roman rule, and outside the main conflicts caused by their kin, Germania itself was still directly impacted by the fall of the Roman Empire. In the coming centuries, it would be thrown into conflict with Rome's successor states. From these conflicts, however, would rise further uniformity and cohesion among the Germans. Though considered a dark age for many reasons, the early medieval ages were a time in which we may find the roots of modern Europe, along with its cultures, languages, and ethnic identities. Germany is no exception to this. While the east of the modern nation was at this time inhabited by Slavs, in the west and south, Franks, Frisians, Bavarians, Saxons, Alemanni, and Thuringians were slowly becoming more recognizably Germans. The Franks are of considerable importance. They would unify the tribe and extend beyond modern Germany. Power was beginning to center around the Franks in former Gaul under Clovis I of the Merovingian dynasty, who became king of the Franks in 481. Clovis began to expand his domain with force into lands held by the last bastions of Romans and other Germanic tribes. By 508, his empire extended throughout a large share of modern Germany, France, and the Low Countries. 
It was in this year that he made the decision to convert his kingdom to Catholicism, beginning large-scale conversion of the peoples formerly outside the Christian Roman Empire. When Clovis died around 512 AD, his kingdom was divided among his four sons in accordance with Frankish tradition. This process of division of lands among the sons of the Frankish rulers would impede the unified growth of their domain and the emergence of something like a true nation-state or even a true kingdom in a more modern sense for quite some time. And in fact, much of the situation of early medieval Germany is defined by this practice, which is called partible inheritance as opposed to primogeniture where the firstborn child gets about everything. Sometimes these rulers would work cohesively, as they were expected to. The intention was, after all, to create separate domains of one larger kingdom, but other times saw crippling civil wars. The Franks would continue pushing into Germany, but infighting would continue and the kingdom would eventually be divided into three regions, Neustria, Austrasia, and Burgundy, with modern Germany belonging mostly to Austrasia. Along with conflict between themselves, they were also constantly involved in wars with foreigners, including the westward expanding Slavs and Avars. Depending on the circumstances in the Frankish domains at the time, the Germans would rule with more or less autonomy. Paganism was still common in Germany itself, especially among the majority of the country outside Frankish rule, and there was yet to be a written German language apart from the aforementioned Gothic, which was being forgotten in favor of Latin. In 613, Clotar II of Neustria reunited the Franks and established what is called the Mayor of the Palace to help with administration of the kingdom, in effect a kind of prime minister. Germany would continue throughout this period at the center of a dark age. The German peoples were caught in a power struggle between many competing forces on the continent, but were still united somewhat by a common culture and similar languages. By the 8th century, the Merovingians had become effectively puppet kings. The men with the real power were the mayors of the palace. In 718, Charles Martel secured this position. Charles the Hammer, as his name meant in Old French, is remembered most famously for his victory at the Battle of Tours, where he defeated the Muslim Umayyads, preventing nations such as France or even Germany from Islamic takeover. However, Charles would struggle not only with Muslims, but Germans as well. Before that battle, which took place in 732, he was involved in war against Bavarians, Saxons, Alemanni, and Frisians from 718 to 730. The Bavarians were often independent-minded and uncooperative, not something that would change anytime soon, and the Saxons were pagans who frequently raided Frankish territory. In 751, the veil was officially taken off by Martel's successor with the support of the Pope. Charles Martel's son, Pepin the Short, deposed the last Merovingian king, Childeric III. With the end of the Merovingians came a new dynasty, the Carolingians. Pepin would rule for ten years. His most major contribution, which would have a permanent effect on Europe, was the donation of Pepin, which was essentially a land grant to the Pope, which would be known as the Papal States. However, it would be his son who laid the foundations for much of modern Europe, including the German nation-state, and he is remembered for no less than this achievement, often called Pater Europae, the father of Europe. He is referred to as Charles the Great, Karl der Grosse, or Charlemagne. Charles united both halves of the Frankish Empire in 771 when his brother Carloman died of natural causes. Almost immediately, he set his sights on expanding into Germany, where he would come into contact with one of his greatest foes, the restless pagan Saxons, led by rulers such as one called Widukind, which meant forest child. Back then, that implied something fierce, more like a wolf, as opposed to, you know, freedom flower child. In 772, Charlemagne invaded Saxony, subjugating one of the many tribes and desecrating pagan religious monuments, such as a hollow tree known as Irmund Sul, which the Saxons believed held up the sky. Charlemagne did not stay long, turning his attention to Italy, specifically toward the troublesome Lombards, descendants of German invaders with a name meaning Longbeards, who were agitating the Pope and Italy. Nevertheless, things weren't quite so finished in Saxony. In fact, war would continue for 30 years, until 804. The primary reason for this was paganism, but also the fractured structure of Saxon society. They were not unified and the various groups acted independently and had to be subdued individually. 
When Charlemagne was distracted by other conflicts especially, it tended to revolt, attacking Frankish soldiers, priests, and churches. The Franks would respond bitterly. In one incident, in Verdun in 782, Charlemagne ordered that 4,500 people be beheaded for a rebellion. Even by his contemporaries, this act was seen as excessive brutality. As he subdued the Saxons, he and his missionaries enforced Christianity on them harshly. The penalty for refusing baptism was death. In 785, Vidukin surrendered and willingly agreed to be baptized. The other Saxons fought on. Charlemagne continued to expand eastward, into other parts of Germany as well, and even beyond. In 788, he went to war with the Bavarians. He would then expand further eastward from there, fighting the Avars and Slavs. After years of conquests and conversions, on Christmas Day in 800 AD, Charlemagne was crowned Emperor of the Romans by Pope Leo III. This was the beginning of something that would outlive him for a little over a thousand years. It was not just a pompous title. As time went on, some historians would consider Charlemagne to be the first Holy Roman Emperor. That is not agreed upon, some consider Otto I, whom we will talk about soon, to be the first true ruler a century later, because Charlemagne was not actually the ruler of the Holy Roman Empire in the sense that it would later take. The term holy would not be added until a few hundred years later, but the intention was for Charlemagne's empire to be viewed as the reincarnation of Rome, although admittedly he and his subjects tended to prefer their Frankish identity. As time goes on, the Holy Roman Empire would not really live up to any of its names, as we shall see. The intention of Pope Leo III was to be the spiritual leader of the Christian world and Charlemagne the secular, and for the emperor and pope to work in tandem, ruling over a new Rome. The intended mutually beneficial relationship here, however, would eventually become a source of conflict. This event also caused dispute with the Byzantines, and not for the last time, who were fairly offended by the notion of Charlemagne calling himself Emperor of Rome when they considered themselves the Romans. Remember, of course, that the Roman Empire only fell in the West. The East, or the Byzantines, had continued, and were still standing strong. Pope Leo wasn't concerned by this. The Byzantine head of state at the time was a woman, so he felt that the title was vacant. The tension between East and West would not quickly disappear. In fact, it would carry on until the death of Byzantium itself. Following his coronation, Charlemagne would continue to expand his domain. In total, his empire would encompass almost all of Western and Central Europe, and even beyond. Charlemagne was not only a man of the sword, however. He oversaw a number of intellectual achievements that have led to his reign being referred to as the Carolingian Renaissance. Charlemagne died in 814 AD. The empire he constructed formed the basis for a rebirth of Europe. He had intended to divide his kingdom up among his sons, a practice so firmly rooted in tradition that not even he would break it, but only one, Louis, or Ludwig, would outlive him. While it may seem as though having one heir would hold the empire together, Louis the Pious would not rule as strongly as his father had, and would often have to struggle to keep the empire together against an array of enemies assembling from outside his empire, and even against his own sons. Louis was not a harsh ruler, but he was, quite simply, not the right man for the times. In fact, he is said to have wanted to have been a priest rather than an emperor. He died in 840 AD after a series of external and internal wars. He had tried to leave the empire to his eldest son to prevent the collapse of Christian Europe, but his other sons rebelled successfully against this decision. Two years following the Battle of Fontenoy in 841, the kingdom was divided into three with the Treaty of Verdun. Charles the Bald would rule the western portion, Lothar the lands in the center, and Ludwig the lands in the east, specifically the regions east of the Rhine and north of Italy, Bavaria, Franconia, Saxony, and Swabia. This event is considered a very significant milestone in German history. East and West Francia, now with different languages and cultures, would be basically permanently severed, and were on a path to develop into separate nations. France, and Germany. Ludwig would later receive the old Roman title Germanicus, which meant conqueror of the Germans. Ludwig is promptly known as Louis the German, or Ludwig der Deutsche in German, or Ludwig der Meitz in Czech. 
At this time, as the German identity was in a very important stage of coming together, the peoples of Europe disagreed on what exactly to call this variety of people with similar cultures and languages. This Treaty of Verdun, while it provided stability, would not end the conflict between the three brothers permanently, and fighting would continue on and off. In fact, after Charlemagne, Germany's history for the next few centuries would be marked by constant conflict. Germany, or East Francia, would be surrounded by rivals. At various times fighting Norse Vikings, the Slavs, which would later include groups such as the Moravians and Polish, the Magyars, now on Ludwig's doorstep, the Northern Italians, the Saracens, or Muslims, the Byzantines, and the West Franks, or later the French, to name the main ones. Arguably, East Francia's biggest enemy though was itself. Divisions among family would constantly fracture and divide the land, threatening its very existence for centuries. It was not long before the kingdom of Middle Francia would be broken apart. It was the least stable of the three, and had even less cohesion than that of early France and early Germany, which, though facing division, had at least similar languages and ethnic groups. Many different ones were forming in an awkwardly formed territory now encompassing the Netherlands down to Italy. The territory of Lorraine, however, between modern France and Germany, is a corruption of Lotharingia, and this region still carries the name of Lothar, which is more obvious in the modern German name Lothringen. Ludwig and Charles eventually seized Lorraine and divided it in the Treaty of Meersen. This would not solve the dispute over the region though, in fact, it would be a constant cause of conflict for over a millennium. Ludwig the German died in 876, and as you probably expect at this point, his kingdom was divided among his sons, Ludwig the Younger, Carloman, and Karl, who would, sometime later, be known as Karl der Dicke, or in English, Charles the Fat, who actually, briefly, reunited Charlemagne's empire and became Holy Roman Emperor. Not so much because he was a great conqueror, but because every other heir in Germany and France had died. Karl would be the last to rule over a united Frankish Empire. In the 860s, the Magyars had finally reached East Francia, raiding the territory mercilessly and centering their power not far away in the modern nation of Hungary, which the Magyars would later be responsible for founding. Much of Karl's reign was spent dealing with them, as well as Vikings, whose raids by now reached the city of Aachen, in which Charlemagne had centered much of his empire and where his palace was built, as well as Paris and the Rhineland. Things were not going well for Karl. His rule was brief. His lifelong struggle with sickness and epilepsy made ruling over an uncooperative empire difficult, and he was deposed by his nephew Arnulf in 887. Arnulf would not be able to claim the entire kingdom, however, and the Frankish Empire split apart, this time permanently. The divides between the two halves were too great to seal by now. Arnulf merely retained the German area of the country, East Francia. Importantly, Arnulf did not merely take the throne, he was elected by the nobility to be king. The concept of electing leaders in Germany dated back to ancient times and, as we shall see, did not disappear anytime soon. Arnulf's reign would be marked by unsuccessful wars with the Slavs, Vikings, Moravians, and Magyars. He died in 899 and was succeeded by his six-year-old son, Ludwig the Child, who would only live to the age of 20. Throughout Ludwig's reign, every corner of Germany was ravaged by the Magyar horsemen. Furthermore, the dukes of the various regions or duchies of East Francia asserted more independence, threatening to break the kingdom apart. Ludwig the Child died in the year 911 as the last Carolingian king. The Germans had to focus on their own affairs and elected a king from outside the Carolingian line rather than respect Charles the Simple, King of France's claim to the throne. One such affair was the Magyars, who were a more major threat to the Germans than the Vikings, which France was focused on. Conrad, Duke of Thuringia, was elected to be their king. The election of rulers was resurfacing as a common trend, and it is here where we begin to see the complex political structure of what would be called the Holy Roman Empire arise, although Conrad did not receive the title of Emperor of Rome. That had gone to rulers in Italy at this point, becoming essentially a reward the Pope gave out to any ruler who would help him. Conrad, though king in name, did not have much authority over the dukes who made him king, and he would struggle to assert his authority throughout his reign, often fighting both his subjects and foreigners alike. 
he was more like a grand duke than king. This power struggle between the monarch and nobles of the semi-autonomous states that put him there would be another feature which would mark the Holy Roman Empire's existence in the long run. Conrad would actually be severely wounded fighting the rebellious Bavarians, and on his deathbed he proposed to his brother that Heinrich, the Duke of Saxony, should be the next king. Heinrich was an enemy of Conrad, but Conrad knew he was the man that could hold the nation together. Conrad died in 918, and the nobles appeared to agree with him, electing Heinrich as their next king a few months later. Heinrich, known as Heinrich der Vogler, or Henry the Fowler after his hobby of falconry, was the first native German to be king of Germany, beginning the Saxon dynasty. The threat of the Magyars was an immediate concern of Heinrich upon his rise to power. Though initially facing defeat against them, he eventually had a stroke of luck, defeating the Magyars and taking the son of their leader prisoner. In exchange for the Magyar prince's release, he demanded ten years of peace. The brief ceasefire allowed Heinrich the opportunity to continue war with the Slavs, train his infantry, and build fortifications around his domain. In 932, when the Magyars returned, he defeated them at the Battle of Riata, dealing a major blow to them. Heinrich was a great ruler militarily, but he never consolidated power politically in a form of absolute rule either. Germany persisted as a kind of confederation of semi-autonomous duchies over which he had limited power. Nevertheless, he had strengthened and protected the nation as a whole. He died 936 AD. His son was elected that year. Importantly, Heinrich did not divide his domain among his sons, despite an opportunity to do so, leaving it all intact to his successor. His son, Otto, would reign for nearly 40 years. In that time, his achievements in building the German nation and the Holy Roman Empire would earn him the title, The Great. Otto was ambitious and bold, essentially viewing himself as no less than the successor of Charlemagne. His reign was marked, naturally, early on by conflict with his younger brother and the other German nobles. And furthermore, he was involved in the regular wars with Slavs, Vikings, and French. However, as time went on, Otto actually began to break out of this continuous cycle that caused this disorder. He defeated his rivals and then began to try to transform the structure of the German nation at the time by centering power on the monarchy. He would replace rebellious dukes and nobles with those loyal to him, commonly relatives, and intentionally overrule the authorities of all the others, signifying that loyalty to and cooperation with the monarch was the way forward. He ruled from horseback, often touring his domain for half the year. He would endeavor to control the church and use it as a means to strengthen his rule. By the 950s, he had settled many of his domestic troubles and began to expand outward. One of his prime interests was Italy, where the widowed queen of northern Italy, Adelaide, called to Otto for help after Berengar II had usurped her husband's throne. Otto crossed the Alps in 951, where he took the city of Pavia. He would, in turn, marry Adelaide, his second wife. This second marriage angered Otto's son from his first wife, Leodolf, especially when she bore him a son, who threatened Leodolf's succession. Outraged, he would rebel against his father in 953 alongside other frustrated nobles. The rebellion spiraled out of control, and the situation was exacerbated when the Magyars moved into Bavaria. Leodolf would later become cooperative with the Magyars. It was not long before the situation began to threaten Otto's reign itself, but it would be abruptly ended in 954, partially because so many nobles felt that an alliance with the Magyars was excessive treachery. Otto, at times a very merciful ruler, forgave his son for all his crimes. With the domestic situation finally stable, Otto now turned his attention to the invading Magyars. In the spring of 955, war with the Magyars would resume, but Otto would defeat them on multiple occasions throughout the year. On August 10th, the two sides were squaring up for a major battle, the Battle of Lechfeld, near Augsburg in Bavaria. Otto had a force of around 8,000 men obtained from across Germany and Bohemia. The Magyars likely had a force around twice the size of this. Despite this, Otto had some favorable factors. 
The battle was to take place on a narrow plain between two rivers. The Magyars were not as accustomed to fighting pitched battles. They were horse archers who preferred hit-and-run tactics. Despite the swarm of arrows that rained down on the German troops, they were no match for Otto's heavy cavalry, the predecessor of the medieval knight. They destroyed the Magyars in this battle, dealing a fatal blow to them. Following this, the Magyars gave up on their raiding of Western Europe altogether. That same year, Otto would lead his forces to victory against the invading Slavs and pushed further into their territory. His victories over the foreign pagan invaders led to many viewing him as the savior of Christendom. Things were beginning to go smoothly for him when, in 958, trouble in Italy returned with Berengar. Otto intervened, and by 962, he had taken much of northern Italy for himself, effectively conjoining northern Italy and Germany. That year, the Pope would bestow upon him the same title which had been given to Charlemagne, Emperor of Rome. Thus, as a result of this, what would later be called the Holy Roman Empire began, or continued. It is debated, but regardless, this was the beginning of a new age for the kings of Germany, as the First Reich, with Otto as the first German to hold the title. His empire throughout the centuries would be regarded not as an empire, but as THE empire. Not a state within Christendom, but the true Christian state. Almost immediately, however, conflict between the Pope and Emperor began, and Otto had John XII deposed and replaced. This would temporarily help things, but Otto would struggle with the papacy and Italy for the rest of his life, and would even have to end up ruling from Rome at certain points to stabilize things. Italy, however, would seldom in the Empire's history be happy under the rule of the Teutons and would always be distant. To try to ease relations with the Byzantines, who were again jealous of the title of Emperor of Rome, which he had taken, Otto's youngest and sole surviving son and heir, also named Otto, at this time 16, would marry a Byzantine princess, Theophano, the emperor's niece, who was at this time 12. Otto would die the following year in 973. Otto II became king immediately thereafter, his position secured even before his father's death, as the nobles elected him king with Otto I breathing down their necks. Much of his reign was marked by domestic conflict which arose without his father there, as well as war with the Danes, French, Arabs, Slavs, and Byzantines, but when he died suddenly at the age of 28 from malaria, his young son, who would be Otto III, was elected and crowned. Despite the issues facing the empire and an attempted usurpation, the crown would successfully pass to Otto III when he was of age in 994. Otto III, though young, was exceptionally bright, and he envisioned himself as the true ruler of Christendom, the one who would truly revive the Roman Empire. In January of 1002, however, at the age of 21, he died while suppressing rebellion in Italy of a strange sudden fever. Otto III had died unexpectedly without having been married and with no children. Whatever future he envisioned, along with the stability that the Etonians and their subjects had brought to the empire, would now be challenged as multiple contenders bickered for the throne. Eventually, his cousin, Heinrich, Duke of Bavaria, would become king in a complicated and heated contention in which rivals once more went to war but he became Heinrich II in 1002, King of Italy in 1004, and Holy Roman Emperor in 1014. Clearly, much of his reign was spent trying to secure the authority that the Etonians had wielded. He also spent time fighting Poland over the territory of Bohemia, the modern-day Czech Republic. The independent-minded German nobles, or princes, weren't heartbroken to see a distracted, weak king on the throne. Heinrich died in 1024, again with no heir. This brought an end to the Ottonian dynasty, and once more the German nobles would have to choose a king. They would choose Conrad II, thus beginning the Salian dynasty. Conrad, like his predecessors, spent much of his early reign traveling around his domain. It may seem odd that a ruler would spend so little time in the capital city, but at this time, and for much of the time, there was no capital city of the Holy Roman Empire. The closest thing would have been the city of Aachen, but effectively, the capital of the empire was wherever the emperor was. In 1032, Conrad incorporated Burgundy into his domain. Though gained diplomatically at the top, the nation still had to be taken by force. 
Burgundy, along with the kingdoms of Germany and Italy, would form the base of the Holy Roman Empire, along with Bohemia, although that is a different story. The Holy Roman Emperors, though losing power slowly, were still, at the time, perhaps the strongest men in Europe, but their power would soon be challenged again, as the seeds of an inevitable conflict planted as far back as Charlemagne begun to sprout, a power struggle between the Emperor and Pope, remembered as the Investiture Controversy. As you recall, the practice of using the church to keep a grasp over Germany and the whole empire dates back quite far. In a country struggling with unity, the church was a centralizing, unified force. Bishops typically held similar power as the German princes. Up to this point, positions of power within the Church of Germany weren't handed out by the Pope. They were handed out by the emperors, to ensure the church's loyalty to him. At times, the emperor even felt he had the power to install or depose popes. In turn, though, the Pope was the sole person who could crown a king, Holy Roman Emperor. The notion that a German king, or any secular lord, should have this power was challenged by the Gregorian Reform Movement. This refers to a focus on reforms such as allowing the Pope to be elected by a college of cardinals rather than appointed by the Emperor, and for the Church to be responsible in handling the positions of its own officials. The reforms began in 1056, not coincidentally at the same time of riot and conspiracy in Germany under the six-year-old king Heinrich IV. The situation escalated in 1075 when Pope Gregory VII issued the Dictatus Papae, asserting that the church was founded by God, that the pope alone can depose or instate bishops, and that he may even depose emperors. Heinrich IV was not interested in complying with a list of rules that would undermine his power, he sent the Pope a letter, making his intentions quite clear that he intended to remove him. Pope Gregory, though, was prepared. He soon announced that Heinrich IV was no longer king and excommunicated him from the church. Heinrich prepared to move south to depose the Pope, but he was prevented from doing so by native unrest. His discontented subjects leapt at the opportunity to legally rebel against him, and he was grounded by civil war with his subjects who had the support of the Pope. Fearing defeat in 1077 at the city of Canossa, in the famous Walk to Canossa, Heinrich marched barefoot in thin clothing through the snow to see the Pope, where he waited and fasted for three days at the castle gates until Pope Gregory finally received him. This act was humiliating, to say the least. Heinrich's predecessors could make or break a Pope with a wave of their hands. Now, here he was begging to one for his kingdom. Nevertheless, Heinrich was forgiven, and his excommunication was lifted. His relationship with the Pope had been improved, but the German nobles weren't so forgiving. Rather, they had designs to continue the Great Saxon Revolt, as it is called, and elect a new king, Rudolf von Rheinfelden. The revolt would continue, and in 1080, things seemed to get worse when Pope Gregory took the side of Rudolf and excommunicated Heinrich again. This time, however, Heinrich was prepared, and he received a stroke of luck. Rudolf would die that year. The following year, with the rebellion waning, he invaded Rome. As Heinrich marched further, the Pope was forced to call on a new ally, recruiting the Normans, who had recently occupied southern Italy. In 1084, they came to his rescue, but when the populace of Rome revolted against Norman occupation, the Normans plundered and burned much of the city. Pope Gregory had won their support, but now Rome opposed him, and he had to leave with the Normans to return south, where he died a year later. Heinrich thus elevated his choice for Pope, Clement III, who crowned him Holy Roman Emperor. This would not end the conflict, however, and in fact the conflict would not end until 1122 when Heinrich's son, Heinrich V, who had often opposed his father in fact, signed the Concordat of Worms with Pope Calixtus II. The church had effectively won its right to greater power and independence. This conflict dealt a great blow to the Holy Roman Empire. It saw the power of the papacy grow and the power of the empire begin to weaken. As the nobility had resisted the power of the monarch for so long in Germany, that contradicting him was commonplace. The concept of separatism was greatly favored in northern Italy, and to the west, amid this chaos and insubordination, the English and French were beginning to supplant the empire's position as the leading power in Europe. Though the church had gained an upper hand, and though the title of Holy Roman Emperor was still not an inherited title, rather one granted solely by the Pope, it would not be the end over the debate of who was ultimately more powerful. Emperor or Pope. 
As we get into this period of history, I suppose I should preface the Holy Roman Empire to try to make it clearer to understand. A lot of people find the history and structure of the Holy Roman Empire to be bizarre and confusing, and if it seems that way, it's essentially because it is. Even foreigners around it at the same time remarked that it was excessively complicated and confusing. We of course saw the Autonians trying to consolidate power around the monarchy, and the Salians held a good degree of power until the investiture controversy as well, but this problem of a lack of centralized authority does not get much better over time. In truth, except for a few intervals, it gets worse. The emperors don't really wield true, unchallenged authority over everyone. They are in regular conflict with the nobility and other forces of power in the country, like the church and cities, and this feature kind of prevents it from unifying into a cohesive nation-state. In France and England, for example, we can see clear centralization of power, a clear chain of command, cohesion among the organs of the nation. It's not always perfect, but it works. That doesn't happen with the Holy Roman Empire. It exists as a kind of loose union of microstates with too much autonomy to really get the nation off its feet and moving as a real empire. The microstates later have their own armies, currencies, laws, that sort of thing. And this is interesting because throughout the upcoming period of history, Germany should have been a major power to rival France, England, Spain later on. However, a number of bizarre circumstances prevented the power within the country from being harnessed, and that doesn't change until much later. Not to say that this was some sort of failed state, however. It was unusual, but it did last for a thousand years, which suggests that there is a method to the madness, which we shall see. As the Christian world came under threat by Islamic dominance of the Holy Land around the same time as the investiture controversy, Germany, finding itself greatly wounded by these events, participated very little in the First Crusade. Rather, it fell in a period of relative isolation. In 1125, Heinrich V died childless as the last ruler of the Salian dynasty. Accordingly, Conrad of the Hohenstaufen dynasty eventually came to the throne after attempts to prevent him and an interregnum. In 1152, Conrad's nephew Friedrich was elected king. One of Friedrich's first acts was to begin campaigning in Italy, subduing the independent-minded northern Italians, the Milanese in particular. Eventually, he reached Rome, where he was crowned Holy Roman Emperor. While in Italy, Friedrich would be given the name by which he is better known to this day, Redbeard, or in Italian, Barbarossa. Shortly thereafter, Barbarossa married Beatrice of Burgundy, securing his rule over all three main components of the empire once more. Barbarossa would spend much of his rule struggling with Italy and the Pope Alexander III. This struggle, in fact, was to lead to the placement of holy in the term Holy Roman Empire, or Sacrum Imperium Romanum in Latin, Heiliges Römisches Reich in German. The term holy was not meant to show fidelity to the Pope. Rather, it was added to show independence from him, implying that the position of emperor was not some reward from the church, it was a position handed by God directly to the emperor, without the pope's involvement. Barbarossa would campaign in Italy five times. He had goals to extend control all the way to Sicily, but in the end, he was defeated by the Lombard League, an alliance of many rebellious states of northern Italy as well as the pope, Venice, Sicily, and the Byzantines, at the Battle of Legnano. Barbarossa would also have to deal with power struggles at home as well. His cousin, Heinrich der Löwe, Henry the Lion, Duke of Bavaria and Saxony, was an increasingly powerful individual. In his territories, he was keenly interested in founding cities and expanding his power. One such city, in Bavaria, was a town called München, home of the monks, today the city of Munich, which remains as Bavaria's capital. Along with Bavaria and Saxony, Heinrich the Lion also pressed east into Slavic lands, a holy mission to convert the Slavs and Baltic peoples, the last European pagans, to Christianity, also presented an opportunity for Germans of all social status to expand eastward into sparsely inhabited and undeveloped lands. This expansion, which would last for centuries, is collectively referred to as Ostsiedlung, the East Settling. The Ostsiedlung would soon evolve into a lesser known chapter of the Crusades, one which prominently featured Germans and Germany, the Northern Crusades, as well as Danes, Swedes, and Poles. Heinrich the Lion's power would increase to the point of him being able to challenge Barbarossa, 
even refusing to campaign with him in Italy. Barbarossa, viewing this as treachery, stripped him of his titles and exiled him for some time to England. This did not solve the lack of cohesion among his nation at home and abroad that he was facing, however. Barbarossa's last campaign would be the Third Crusade, where he endeavored to reclaim the Holy Land from the Muslim invaders in tandem with the French King Philip Augustus and the English King Richard the Lionheart. Before he could reach the Holy Land, however, in 1190, Barbarossa fell off his horse into a river where he drowned to death. He was succeeded by his son Heinrich, who became Heinrich VI. He would rule for seven years, during which time he expanded the empire all the way to Sicily, a territorial claim which concerned the Pope. He died in 1197. His son, Friedrich, was only three at the time, and the throne became disputed as two kings were elected. Heinrich VI's brother, Philip I, and Heinrich the Lion's son, Otto IV. Civil war erupted and continued until Friedrich II came of age. When he did, he won the Pope's support by promising to let go of Sicily, and became undisputed king in 1215. He won the support of his nobles by doing what his predecessors had struggled in vain against, granted the nobility further rights and independence. Friedrich is remembered as a rather bright, in fact, intellectual king. Friedrich Nietzsche would later refer to him as the first European. Speaking of Sicily, despite his promise to the Pope, he did not release it. He was actually able to form a strong, effective centralized government there. This angered the Pope. Furthermore, Friedrich was crowned promising that he would embark on a crusade, which he had thus far failed to do as well. In fact, his hesitation to embark on the Fifth Crusade is often cited as the reason for its failure. Friedrich would be excommunicated four times throughout his life in his struggles with the papacy, even being called the Antichrist on one occasion by Pope Gregory IX. Friedrich would embark on a crusade, however. Two, in fact. The Sixth Crusade, where he miraculously won Jerusalem by negotiation, which the Pope, hoping for a great battle, wasn't happy about, and of course, the Northern Crusades. Friedrich had elevated Hermann von Salza to be the Grand Master of the Teutonic Order around 1210. The Teutonic Knights would be key to expanding into territories such as Livonia and Prussia. In fact, they had been granted permission to rule over the pagan territories which they conquered. The Teutonic Order's rule over the territory of Prussia would lead to massive German migration and the Germanization of the people there, which would have long-term effects on German and European history. Friedrich's reign became greatly unstable in the 1240s, as the papacy fought against him and engineered plots to overthrow him, notably with an archbishop's support of two different rival kings, Wilhelm of Holland and Henry Raspe. Meanwhile, the Teutonic Order was taking on the far reaches of the Mongol army. In the middle of the struggle, in 1250, Friedrich died. His son died only a few years later, ending Hohenstaufen rule. The Holy Roman Empire was effectively entering into its first great interregnum, where no king was able to receive undisputed approval until 1272, though confusion and uncertainty would last longer than this in both the empire and the papacy. The power of the nobility and bishops only fed off this, increasing their power and cementing their autonomy, with each noble commonly building his own castle to cement his authority in this time period, Germany is today one of the most castled regions in the world. Despite a major lack of central authority, however, the German kingdom would continue in many of its endeavors, including the push eastward, which was less affected by home affairs. Amid this confusion and division arose a house which would come to be one of the most important in the Holy Roman Empire, and one of the most influential houses in European history. From the Archduchy of Austria, which had split off from Bavaria in the 12th century, came the Habsburgs. The first Habsburg to be elected king was Rudolf I. Though king of Germany, he would not be Holy Roman Emperor. The ecclesiastical and secular princes during this time were not interested in a leader. They were interested in a servant, and were more resilient than ever towards the king's attempts to rule them. Accordingly, this was not the Habsburgs rise to power. It was only temporary foreshadowing, as it would be some time before they had a permanent hold on Germany. The Habsburgs lost power in Germany after Rudolf though he had established his family by making his sons the Dukes of Austria and Styria. The German electors, fearing the power of the house, thus elected kings from different houses, some of whom were chosen specifically because they lacked power and would be weak rulers. From the surface, this arrangement of things probably appears to have greatly favored the princes, 
However, in turn, the princes found themselves struggling to maintain rule over their domains and the nobility, church, knights, and cities within them, who often acted independently as well. The cities in Germany in particular in this time period operated fairly independently. They weren't exactly city-states, like in Italy, but they weren't always subservient to the surrounding country, and oftentimes they banded together to promote their own interests. One example of this is the Hanseatic League, from the German word Hansa, which means guild, which was both a trading and also a defensive league administered by German merchants extending from London to Novgorod. By the 15th century, some of these cities became imperial cities, which were effectively as autonomous as other parts of the country. Heinrich VII was crowned king in 1308, becoming Holy Roman Emperor in 1312. During his reign, the Teutonic Knights captured the city of Gdansk, or in German, Danzig, linking Germany and Prussia geographically. Heinrich died a few years into his reign though, and was succeeded by his son, Ludwig IV, in a contested election. The Pope, furthermore, refused to acknowledge his claims, but in 1338, the German electors agreed to the Declaration of Varenza. In this declaration, they stated that the right of the Emperor to rule was no longer dependent on the Pope's approval. Whomever the electors chose to be king would be king, and with the title of king automatically came the title of Holy Roman Emperor, or in German, Kaiser, from the Latin Kaiser, or as we more commonly pronounce it, Caesar. This decision later paved the way for the Golden Bowl of 1356 to be issued under Karl IV, who was also king of Bohemia and a part of the House of Luxembourg, beginning his reign as well as the reign of his house in 1346. The Golden Bull finally solidified and organized the process by which emperors would be elected. The emperors would be elected by seven Kurfürsten, or prince electors. Three of them were ecclesiastical, the Archbishop of Mainz, the Archbishop of Cologne, and the Archbishop of Trier. Four were secular, the King of Bohemia, the Count Palatine of the Rhine, the Duke of Saxony-Wittenberg, and the Margrave of Brandenburg. The Golden Bull is at times referred to as the German Magna Carta. These changes marked the beginning of a new identity for the Holy Roman Empire. It would end, or attempt to end, constant civil wars caused by succession debates, but in truth, to a degree, it was a significant milestone on the empire's gradual path toward irrelevancy. The empire had lost its vision of being a universal Christian empire. The emperors were now dependent on the electors. This would greatly impede its ability to project power beyond its own borders. Around the same time that these changes were occurring, Germany was invaded by a new enemy, the Black Death, caused by three different strains of plague. Between 1347 and 1351, it would kill around half of Europe's population. Germany was thankfully not hit quite as hard, but it was still dealt a heavy blow by losing 20% of its population. When Karl IV died, his son Wenceslaus was elected in 1378, yet Wenceslaus was deposed by the electors in 1400. His behavior was seen as rather degenerate and his rule ineffective, though he did remain king of Bohemia. He was replaced by Ruprecht III. As long as Wenceslaus lived, however, Ruprecht's reign was contested and domestic conflict was a feature throughout his reign. On the verge of civil war in 1410, Ruprecht died, and though Wenceslaus wanted the throne, it would pass to his younger brother, Sigismund. Sigismund was a bright and energetic man, and was in fact already king of Hungary. He had spent considerable time campaigning against the Muslim Ottomans as the head of the Order of the Dragon. Sigismund's early reign was marked by handling a large number of affairs. He would go to war with the Venetians, he would be very much involved in the Teutonic-Polish wars erupting to the northeast, and he would help end the Papal Schism, a dispute which had divided the church among three competing popes. He would do this with his suggestion of the Council of Constance. At the Council of Constance as well, the matter of a Catholic priest named Jan Hus was addressed. Jan Hus was a Bohemian, or Czech, reformer who had wanted to change the behavior and practices in the Catholic Church in a time when its schism was deteriorating its image. Hus wasn't tolerated, and he was burned at the stake in 1415 in Constance despite Sigismund's vow of protection. This would not end the discontent, however. Rather, it would enrage it, as many Czechs had favored Hus and viewed him now as a martyr. 
public unrest brewed in Bohemia, which evolved into civil war. In 1419, Wenceslaus died and Sigismund came to the throne of Bohemia as well, declaring that he would drown all the Hussite heretics. In 1421, the Pope escalated the situation by calling a crusade against the Hussite Czechs. The Hussites weren't pushovers. The conflict that was emerging would last for years, and they in fact took the fight to Germany, Hungary, and the Teutonic lands where they allied themselves with the Polish in the polish Teutonic War of 1431-35. The Hussites themselves, however, soon split into separate branches, and the Utrechtists, the more moderate of the two, were victorious. The war ended in 1434 with a mix of results. Neither side was really victorious. The Hussites were reincorporated into Bohemia, but they were allowed to continue practicing some of their religious beliefs. Sigismund died the following year. His successor would be Friedrich III from the House of Habsburg. Another house, the Hohenzollerns, had gained power in Brandenburg, Prussia. With the compromise between the Hussites and Catholics, more radical church reform would be delayed by a century. But it was coming. Reform which would rock Christianity and Europe to its core would be sparked under a German monk named Martin Luther. In the next video, we will see where all this leads, and learn how Germany copes with the rise of Protestantism and later, the beginnings of modern Europe. We will explore the roles of the Austrian and Prussian empires, Napoleon's empire, the unification of Germany, the world wars, and the modern nation of today. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you'd like to stay up to date with part 2, as well as to see other videos I've made, such as these documentaries here on history and science, and other upcoming videos, I'd encourage you to check out Fire of Learning and subscribe. To help support the costs of production, Fire of Learning does take donations on Patreon, the link to which you can find in the description. The Patreon was down for a little bit, but it is now back up, and I would like to take a moment to thank Chris Yates, Jonathan Trillo, and Marek Stephenson for their support. Danke for watching.